Today, a ceasefire deal in Lebanon, but Gazans fear abandonment. Donald Trump's threatening tough tariffs in an effort to curb fentanyl. President Biden's push to approve GLP-1 weight loss drugs for Medicaid and Medicare. And the U.S. prepares for a supersized portion of economic data ahead of Thanksgiving. It's Wednesday, October 27th. This is Reuters World News, bringing you everything you need to know from the front lines in 10 minutes every weekday. I'm Tara Oaks in Liverpool. And I'm Christopher Waljesper in Chicago. I'm pleased to announce that their governments have accepted the United States proposal to end the devastating conflict between Israel and Hezbollah. President Joe Biden announcing the ceasefire brokered by the U.S. and France, which came into effect this morning at 4 a.m. local time in Lebanon and Israel. He says the deal is designed to be a permanent cessation of hostilities. The news has been met with celebrations in the southern Lebanese city of Tyre. As a group stood by a road cheering and throwing rice at cars driving past. While in Sidon, displaced people started packing their belongings in preparation to return to their villages in the south. Under the terms of a truce, Israel will gradually withdraw its forces over the next 60 days, as Lebanon's army takes control of a territory near the border to ensure Hezbollah does not regroup there. But as this ceasefire takes hold, what of the Palestinians in Gaza? Without a similar deal with Hamas, Gazans are feeling abandoned and fearful that Israel will focus squarely on its onslaught in the enclave. Nidal al Magrabi is our senior correspondent reporting on Gaza. Many among the Palestinians, especially in Gaza, feel the world has not put enough pressure and effort in order to reach a similar ceasefire agreement uh, in Gaza. Some remains hopeful that the United States Arab mediators will now focus their efforts to reach a deal in, in Gaza that will end the war with Israel and end uh, their suffering. But the voice of pessimism actually is higher. So what could this ceasefire mean for Hamas and the war in Gaza? Hamas blames the lack of an agreement of ceasefire in the Gaza Strip on uh, the Israeli side. And we also know that the Israeli side and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has repeatedly accused Hamas of uh, failing uh, the efforts to reach a ceasefire. So this continued dispute between Hamas uh, and, uh, and Israel is what is holding an agreement in the Gaza Strip. China's defense minister is under investigation for corruption, according to a Financial Times report. He's the third consecutive serving or former defense minister to be investigated for alleged corruption in a probe which has roiled the top ranks of the People's Liberation Army. The Chinese Foreign Ministry says the FT is chasing shadows. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Court says he is seeking an arrest warrant for Myanmar's military leader. The warrant would be for crimes against humanity over the alleged persecution of the Rohingya, a mainly Muslim minority. Former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan's party has suspended street protests demanding his release from jail, according to local media. That's after a sweeping midnight raid by security forces in the capital Islamabad, in which hundreds of people were arrested. President-elect Donald Trump has chosen trade lawyer Jameson Greer as his new U.S. trade representative. He's a key veteran of Trump's first-term trade war against China and points to a bruising four years for trade negotiations the world over. Greer served as chief of staff to Trump's former U.S. trade representative Robert Lighthizer, the architect of Trump's original tariffs on billions of dollars worth of Chinese imports, and the renegotiation of the North American free trade deal with Canada and Mexico. Curbing the flow of fentanyl is one of the reasons Trump's given for new proposed tariffs on Mexico, China and Canada. Many of the ingredients used to manufacture the drug come from China and are then used to produce the drug in Mexico before it finds its way over the US border, 
where more than 400,000 Americans have died from overdoses in the last decade. Our U.S.-China relations reporter, Michael Martina, has been looking into how Trump might use this economic weapon to address a drug epidemic. Usually tariffs traditionally have been employed as a means to sort of address trade imbalances. That's certainly what Trump tried to do in his first term. Here it seems to be a little bit different in that Trump is essentially resorting to his weapon of choice, which is tariffs to create leverage in a sort of diplomatic relationship with China. So how else is Trump looking to tackle the fentanyl crisis? Well, obviously China is one aspect of the fentanyl crisis. Trump has been much more direct in saying how he'll go after the sort of the, the Mexico leg of this. He, wa- he wants to name the cartels terrorist organizations and he's even invoked using the U.S. military to, uh, to crack down them. And, and how that plays out with Mexico, that's going to be one of the most interesting things things to watch here early in the, in the Trump administration. How has China responded to these allegations that it's involved in the flow of fentanyl? Well, China's been adamant all along that this idea that it's sort of intentionally fueling this crisis, they say it's ridiculous. In response to Trump's statements, they've always said that a trade war will serve no one. And frankly, it seems that with the Chinese economy in sort of tough shape at the moment, A trade war is not something they really want to fight. And um, I think perhaps the incoming Trump administration assesses some of that and wants to make a a, a press there. Now, Mexico's president, Claudia Scheinbaum, warned on Tuesday that Trump's tariffs would bring dire economic consequences for both countries and suggested possible retaliation. President Joe Biden is proposing an expansion of Medicare and Medicaid coverage to include anti-obesity drugs like Ozempic, Wagovi, and Manjaro. The move could make these expensive GLP-1 drugs far more affordable for millions of Americans. But it's not a done deal. Our White House reporter, Andrea Shalal, has been looking into how this proposed change might play out. So until now, Medicare has not covered the use of these drugs simply for the diagnosis of obesity. You had to have another underlying condition. So this move will make it possible for people who previously wouldn't have been able to afford these medications. And the the bottom line really is that this is about long-term health outcomes. So it will cost the government to pay for these drugs for people, but The savings will be huge down the road if you have fewer people with diabetes and with heart disease. But in the end, this rule really depends on the Trump administration, right? Yeah, it's a very good point. These things wouldn't take effect until 2026, and they would require approval by the Trump administration. And one key member of Trump's cabinet could be Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who opposes these drugs and says Americans should lose weight by eating healthier. But he's also said that he wants to choose Mehmet Oz, the television personality and surgeon, to be the administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is the agency that would be administering this rule. And he is in favor. It's a data dump for investors today ahead of the Thanksgiving holiday. We've got U.S. jobless claims, GDP figures, and most crucial of all, inflation figures out later. Carmel Crimmins has more. Investors are going to be homing in on that inflation data for clues about a potential Fed interest rate cut next month. Right now, investors are betting on a 25 basis point cut in December, but officials were divided on further rate reductions at their meeting earlier this month, so that inflation data is going to be key. And you know what, Tara? What's that, Carmel? It ties in nicely with this week's Econ World podcast, which is out later today. It's all about inflation. I'm talking to Rick Reeder. He's the guy in charge of BlackRock's bond business. And I'm talking to him all about inflation and the outlook for it as we head into a Trump presidency. You can catch that on the Reuters app, Reuters.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. That's it for today's show. We're off on Thursday. For those of you who are celebrating, happy Thanksgiving. 
For today's recommended reads, check out our story on the shared air smog problem in India and Pakistan, where the city of Lahore has its worst air pollution in five years. There's a link in the pod description. For more on any of the stories from today, check out Reuters.com or the Reuters app. To never miss an episode, follow on your favorite podcast player. We'll be back on Friday with our daily headline show. Hold up. 